Have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 9. The Bible reads, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a, a tabernacle made, the first wherein was, uh, the, can uh, was the candlestick and the, uh, the table and the showbread, uh, which is called the sanctuary. And after uh, the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's uh, rod that budded, and, the, and uh, the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory sh uh, shadowing the mercy, the mercy seat, of which we cannot uh, now speak particularly. Now when... These things were thus ordained. The priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second one went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time uh, then, uh, then present in which uh, were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could uh, not be, that could not make him that uh, did the service per, uh, perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordin uh, ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation but christ being uh, come a high priest of uh, being yeah, come a high priest of good things to come uh, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not with made with hands that is to say not to this building neither by the blood of uh, goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into uh, the holy place having ordained eternal redemption for us for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, uh, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without, uh, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works uh, to serve the living God. And, uh, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first uh, testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal, of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the, testo uh, the testor. For a, a testament is of a force after man or, or men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testament uh, d while the tester liveth whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood for when moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and uh, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament which god hath enjoined uh, unto you moreover he sprinkled with the uh, with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things are by by the law purged with blood uh, with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission it was therefore ne uh, necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with things uh, uh, with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer, uh, he should offer himself often as the high priest uh, entereth into the holy place every year with, the, uh, with blood of others. For then... Must he often have sacrifice? Uh, he must have uh, often have suffered 
since the foundation of the world. But now, once in uh, the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ uh, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that... Uh, that uh, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, uh, fill me, uh, that you would fill me, Holy Spirit, that I would speak your truth in your word. <clears throat> and Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word. And as we hear your word, Lord, that we would do it, that we would purpose it in our hearts to do these things, which your word has asked us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. That was a longer portion of scripture, you know, uh, you know, for this. So tonight I'm actually going to, uh, I'm actually only going to focus on the first 15 chapters. And actually, even on that, I'm actually going to narrow it down to only four uh, verses. Uh, sorry, not four chapters, uh, you know, uh, sorry, 15 chapters, but 15 verses. But I'm actually going to narrow it down even more down to uh, four verses because I believe the, the four verses I'm going to hit hits everything else, you know, in this chapter as well. There was a medical doctor and theologian named M.R. Dahan who said this, he said, the Bible is a blood, or sorry, is a book of blood, wholly distinct from all other books for just one reason, namely that it contains blood circulating uh, through every page and in every verse. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the stream of blood. Dr. Dahan was absolutely right. The book, the Bible is a bloody book. I mean, think about it. It's the blood that saves us, right? The blood, uh, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ is what saves us. From the first verse of the, of the Bible to the very end, this is a book that is uh, that has blood all the way through it. And some people get grossed out about it. They say you need to change that because you can't go to church talking about blood. People won't want to come to church then. Well, that's the whole point of Jesus Christ was His blood. You know, as it says here, that, that without the shedding of blood, there is no more remission. And the thing is, you know, sad thing is, is that, you know, nowadays a lot of, uh, you know, translations have come out and they're, they're getting rid of the blood because they're giving heed to what people say of, well, people don't want to hear about blood. But it's the blood of Jesus Christ that has purged us from our sins, that has taken away our sins. Amen? And we need to uh, realize that we don't uh, need to be afraid of that. We need to embrace it and say, you know what, it's the blood of Jesus that makes me white as snow. It's the blood of Jesus that I was, I was filthy in my sins and in my transgressions, and, you know, the Bible makes me clean. The, uh, Jesus Christ, his sacrifice is enough to make me clean and save me, right? So tonight, as, as, we, uh, as we read, you know, it, obviously we read through this entire part, it's talking about the sacrificial system. It's talking about blood. It's talking about those things. Well, the first 11 verses focus on the Old Testament sacrificial system. It talks about all the sacrifices that they had to make. I mean, it, it speaks of a time when millions of gallons of blood were shed to cover the sins of the people. Now think about that. In the Old Testament, it says that what? That the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices did what? They covered the sin. It didn't take them away. It covered the sin. But Jesus Christ's blood removes your sin. It takes it away. His blood takes away your sin. It doesn't just cover it. It doesn't just put a blanket over it and say, don't peek under there. It's actually gone. And so when we look at these things, it's, it's the fact that all those millions of gallons of blood never saved a single soul in the Old Testament. All those animals dying never saved a single soul at all. What the blood of bulls, goats, and lambs could not do, the blood of Jesus accomplished. That is why on the cross, when he said, it is finished, it is finished. There was no more sacrifices that needed to take place. It was because of his sacrifice that we don't have to uh, keep on sacrificing over and over again. And the thing is, is that this obviously mirrors salvation. If we were to look at, you know, a salvation is the fact, that's the reason why the Bible talks about that Jesus died once and for all, that we don't, we don't worry about losing our salvation. Why? Because if we did, that means that Jesus has to be crucified again and again and again. Why? Because that's what they had to do in the Old Testament to just cover sin. That would be mimicking. That would, there would be no point to Jesus dying upon the cross because then we'd have to sacrifice him over and over again. 
This was something that I brought up a few weeks ago that the Catholic Church still believes. The Catholic Church still believes it. Why? You go into their church, where is Jesus? He's still on the cross. You say, well, that's just decoration and everything else. Well, for one thing, another thing, you can look at it this way. It's an idol as well because we don't know what Jesus looked like, and yet they're saying this is the way he looked. And so we look at these, uh, uh, these different you know, areas and of what Jesus did, and there's some uh, insights tonight I want to talk about about the blood of Jesus. The thing is, is that, and what it does for those that have, uh, that have uh, those who trust him and put their faith in him of what his blood accomplished. So tonight I want to talk to you about, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Number one is this, the purchase of the blood of Jesus. Let's look at verse 12. It says this, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once. How many times he entered in? Once. Why? Because his blood is enough to save you. He can save you once and for all. It said, uh, it said entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. In the, in the purchase of his blood, it, it was a it was a precious purchase. The reason the Old Testament sacrifices could not save was due to the character of the blood that was shed. The blood being shed was animal blood. So however, sin had been introduced into the world by who? Was it by an animal? Sin was introduced into the world by man. That's the reason why you, uh, you needed the man Christ Jesus to die for your sins. Because animals can't, you know, they can't save you, Right? Fifi can't save you. Fido can't save you. Aren't you glad that, that it's not the Old Testament you know, sacrificial system? Because you might have been getting down to your last you know, animal, and it might have been Fifi or Fido at home. You're going, do I live with this sin? Or does Fifi go away? Does he go to the farm? And the thing is, is that we don't have to worry about those things nowadays. The blood being, uh, like I said... The, you know, salvation was dependent on the sacrifice of an innocent man. Well, who's the innocent man? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ obviously fits that bill. When Jesus went, uh, you know, uh, came as the, the Lamb of God, the blood he shed was pure, precious, sinless blood. If you want some verses, you know, and a lot of these verses I'm not going to read, but I, I will reference them, is Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. But his blood was of the character that could satisfy the just demands of a holy God. We know this you know, from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. His, the purchase of his blood was a personal purchase. It was not just a precious purchase, it was a personal purchase. This, uh, this verse tells us in, in, in verse 12, it says, it was his own blood. That's a little personal, isn't it? Aren't you kind of attached to your own blood? You can't live without it, right? The depth of this statement has, has not and nor ever will be, be able to be fathomed completely by our human minds because we won't be able to understand completely what he accomplished. We just, we just don't have that. I mean, we, we know what we need to know, but there's so much more. To understand, uh, uh, you know, this thought demands that we understand how God himself could be born in human flesh and how he could submit to death on a cross for sinners. I mean, think about that. The Bible talks about the fact of that, you know, if a person is, you know, is a good person, somebody would probably die for him. But are you going to die for somebody that hates you? Somebody that, you know, that hates your guts, you're not going to die for him. You're going to say, you know what, they can go just go on and, you know, do whatever they want to but Jesus Christ didn't do that. He died for those that hated his guts, and that still do. But that's exactly what he did for each and every single one of us. You can see that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. I mean, think about it. That's a truth that is glorious beyond compare, that he would die not only for, for uh, his friends you know, and, all, and his, his, his stepfamily and everything else, and who else for those who actually hate him? You say, well, why would you say stepfamily? 
because you know what? Uh, Jesus had a different father than everybody else in his family. And he did have brothers and sisters. The Bible flat out says that. That's another thing. If you're, if you're taking you know, notes as far as like the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church says that Jesus didn't have any siblings. And yet the Bible says it. Even their Bible says it. But they, they explain it away and say, nope, that's not true. It was just a mistranslation. It's a mistranslation in your own translation? Sorry. I'm going off on a tangent. This is not even, you know, this is, this is not even in my notes. It's off my notes. But the fact that he would love you and me so much that he would be willing to endure the agonies of the cross is a truth beyond comprehension. I mean, think about all the stuff, that, you know, that you're going, man, I've done some pretty bad stuff. He still died for you. He still died for you. I mean, the pain of the cross in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6, describes the agony and the pain that he went through. And it, you know, it's amazing, but it's true. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we're out doing all of our you know, wicked, evil things, he died for us. I mean, think about that. You, you, you sit there and say, you know what, you well, when my kids are acting out, I don't know if I really want to be there. For you. You, sometimes you get that thought in your mind, you go, I don't know if I really want to be there for them. We know that you still would be there for them, but at that moment you're going, man, they're trying my patience, but you would still die for them, wouldn't you? And the thing is that most, you know, like I said, most people, with people that they don't even know, that absolutely hate them, they would never die for them. But Jesus you know, still died for them. And why? Because he knows each and every single one of us. There's nobody that Jesus Christ does not know. The, the purchase of his blood was a permanent purchase. The last phrase of this verse is, is, uh, is just filled with meaning. The words, it says, having obtained. That means a, a one-time for all-time action. Having obtained. It's one-time for all-time action. That means, what, you, what did you obtain? Eternal inheritance. What's your eternal inheritance? Eternal life. Life everlasting. One time for, uh, for, all, for all time action. The word eternal means what? Abiding, constant, unending. Eternal, never ending. It does not end. And the word redemption means to release after the payment of a ransom price at, uh, after which the guilty party is forever delivered from all guilt and punishment. I mean, th- I mean the last part of that. Is delivered from what? From all guilt and punishment. That's what redemption is. And when all these truths are like all coupled together, we are left with the conclusion that the salvation Jesus provides and the redemption the saints enjoy is what? An eternal redemption. That this this is made even clearer by, you know, I'm gonna give you a list of verses. I'm not gonna read them, like I say, but you you know, so get ready. Make sure your, your pencils are sharpened. This is even made even clearer by the following verses. Hebrews chapter uh, 9, which we're at, verses 25 through, uh, to, through 28. And then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 through 14. And then 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5. John 10, 28, John 6, 37 through 40. So the fact of the matter is this, that if you're saved, you are saved forever. Some might ask, how is this possible? The answer lies in the superiority of Christ's sacrifice to that of the Old Testament. His sacrifice is far superior than the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. The uh, the, the Old Testament sacrifices merely, like I said, has, had said before, it merely just covered sin. Sin. The sacrificial system of, oh, sorry, the sacrificial offering of Christ's blood removed sin forever. It's John one twenty nine. If you're saved, Christ's death on the cross forever settled your sin problem. Romans chapter six. Number two is this, the power of the blood of Jesus. Let's look at verses 13 through 14. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a, of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The power of, of his blood gave us what? The power was the power to cleanse. The word purge literally means to cleanse and free from filth. So when it talks about the fact of him purging your sins, it cleanses you and frees you from that filth of your sin. I mean, it's going back, it actually even refers back to the lepers in the Old Testament about their ceremonial cleansing. That when they talked about purging their sins or purging those things, and obviously lepers were a big problem. I mean, read Leviticus. And I forgot to make this known before, that the Old Testament equivalent of Hebrews is Leviticus. We talked about, you know, obviously last week, you know, started, we started Daniel, and I'm going to have to push it off a couple of weeks, and then we'll go back into Daniel here and kind of like mix and match them, you know, in here. But as Daniel is to Revelation, so Leviticus is to Hebrews. That's why he's going through all this, because Leviticus has what? All the ceremonial laws, it has all the, you know, all the sacrifices, everything that you needed to understand what needed to be offered for your sin, right? Hebrews goes in there, and he's talking to Jews, he's talking you know, to Hebrews, and he's telling them, you know what, whereas you believed all that stuff and everything, and you try to follow that to the best you, here's a better system. Here's a better sacrifice. You don't have to do that anymore, Right? And so that's what, uh, that's the reason why, you know, there's that correlation between the two is that uh, Leviticus and Hebrews are, you know, like kind of go together along, like I said, with Daniel. Because Daniel, at the end of Daniel, we talked about the fact that he maybe makes the comment of saying, I don't understand this. Why don't I understand the stuff that I've written? And God says, it's not for you to understand. And then obviously I believe that if Daniel had revelation, he would understand, he would have understood everything about the end times, everything that he was talking about. It's the same thing, like, if you don't have revelation, you're not going to be able to understand, you know, what, you know, like, okay, all this stuff's going on. Why is that important? Well, then you have Daniel. They, they go uh, back and forth, hand in hand. That's why you can't sit there and say, well, we're just a New Testament church. No, you need to be a Bible-believing church. A Bible-believing church, because you're not going to understand everything if you just go off of, like, the New Testament I believe, you know, that you have the Old Testament and then like the, the Old Testament, then you have the New Testament, which is like the commentary. It helps explain or go in a deeper knowledge of what the Old Testament was trying to show. Okay? But we know, obviously, that the, uh, the old sacrificial system could never completely cleanse the stain of sin away. However, the blood of Jesus cleanses the sinner completely. You don't have to, like I said, it makes you white as snow, right? And that's why the writers of the New Testament are able to say that, that we have been justified. That is, uh, that is, we have been declared right with God. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll flip there with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 9. We're going to go through verse 11. Know ye not that the, righteous, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolater, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor uh, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor... Uh, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And, uh, and such were some of you, but ye are, not, uh, ye are washed, but ye are cleansed, or ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's what, he, that's what he, he's telling us is that, you know what, there is no more stains left. You can go outside and you can go slide on the grass because, you know, I don't know about, you know, your kids, especially I know, well, as a kid, I go out there, get grass stains all over my clothes. And my mom absolutely loved it when I come inside, and she's like, now i got to sit, and she tried to figure out how to get grass stains out, because you can never really get grass stains out, right? 
I don't even know if you could still do it nowadays with all the modern technology. Can you get grass stains out now with all that stuff? No. You sit there, and mom's going, I just bought those pants. Those are your church clothes. I mean, all those things, I've, I've heard them. You know, I, I've heard those things from my mom. But the, here's the thing is, is how hard is it to, how hard is it to get blood out of clothes? Is he, uh, you know, but, but, there's st- but there's still, it's still not, you know, uh, cleansed all the way out. You know, it's, there's still usually a little bit behind, isn't there? I will. But you don't really ever think of blood as being a cleansing agent, though, do you? You don't ever, see, you don't ever sit there and cut your finger and be like, okay, I'm going to take care of this and take, away, you know, take out that stain, right? You don't ever do that. Well, here's the thing. There's a, there's a song, you know, uh, there's, there's a hymn that was uh, written by William Cooper, and it says, A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The Apostle John said that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from what? All sin, right? The multitude in Revelation chapter 7 had washed their robes and made, uh, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But how is blood, like I said, a cleansing agent? How can that happen? To us, blood you know, is a soiling, staining you know, agent, uh, something we try to scrub off, not to try to scrub with, right? There's a, a doctor by the name Dr. Henry Brand explained it this way in Christianity Today. He said this, All that we have learned about physiology in recent years confirms the accuracy of the, of the still jarring juxtaposition or contrast between of blood and cleansing. This is, I suggest, an experiment. If you truly wish to grasp the function of, of blood as a cleansing agent, find a blood pressure kit, Wrap the cuff around your upper arm. When it is in position, have a friend pump it up to around 200 uh, millimeters of mercury, a sufficient, uh, a sufficient uh, pressure to stop the, the flow of blood in your arm. Initially, your arm will feel an uncomfortable tightness uh, beneath the cuff. Now comes the revealing part of the experiment. Perform any easy task with your cuffed arm. Merely flex your finger and make a fist about 10 times in succession or cut a paper with scissors or drive a nail into wood with a hammer. The first few moments will seem normal as the muscles obediently contract and relax. Then you will feel a slight weakness. Almost without warning, a hot flash of pain will strike. After maybe 10 movements, your muscles will cramp. If you force yourself to continue the simple task, you will likely cry out in absolute agony. Finally, you cannot force yourself to continue. The pain overwhelms you, but when uh, you release the tourniquet and the air uh, escapes from the cuff, blood will rush into your aching arm and a wonderful sense of relief will soothe your muscles. Physiologically, you have just experienced the cleansing of the blood. What the blood uh, supply to your arm was... So while the blood supply was shut, uh, sh- uh, while the su- blood supply was to your arm was shut off, you forced your muscles to keep working. As they converted oxygen into energy, they produced certain waste products that are naturally flushed away instantly in the bloodstream due to the constricted blood flow. However, these uh, these uh, waste products accumulated in your cells. They were not cleansed by the swirling stream of blood, and therefore, in a few minutes, you felt agony of the retained toxins. But that is the power of the blood to cleanse in a physical sense. On a spiritual level, the blood of Jesus has the power to take the blackest heart and wash it whiter than snow. I don't suggest you try and do that at home because, you know, as soon as I said, you know, take, you know, put that tourniquet around your arm, everybody's like, oh, no, that's no. I don't usually don't like getting my pressure, you know, my blood pressure taken at the doctor, let alone because it always seems like they just they, they go up to the highest possible one to make sure that you, you know, they cut off all circulation, anyways. But that's the whole thing is is that with that is that we realize what blood does. Obviously, it cleanses our body from those toxins, right? Keeps those things away. And aren't we thankful, you know, for? I don't know if you guys have ever heard the song called "Fountain Filled with Blood," but I want to read you the words to it. 
It says, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and a sinner's, uh, and a sinner's uh, pledge beneath that, uh, that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see uh, uh, that fountain in, uh, in his day, and there have I, though vile as he, washed away all my sin, washed away, sorry, washed all my sins away. Man, I'm having a difficulty tonight. Dear uh, dying lamb, thy, uh, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed of uh, all the ransomed be saved to sin no more. Ever since, uh, ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing a wound supply, redeeming love has been my theme, shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I, uh, I'll sing th thy power to save when this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. I'm, uh, I'm kind of, you know, right now actually identifying with that last line, so... Sometimes you get tongue twisted, right? He also, his blood had the power, not only, uh, his blood not only had uh, the, the power to cleanse, but he had the power to change. His blood has the power to change. When the blood of Jesus is applied, it purges, as it says, it purges the conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We no longer want to do those things that we once did, right? Once we, uh, you know, once we got saved, we're just going, I don't want to do those things anymore. All of a sudden, we have, you know, our conscience, or like, you know, I, I tell my daughter, she goes, what's your conscience? I said, well, now that you're saved, it's the Holy Spirit. And I said, there's things that, you, you, know, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to do and to not do. And I said, and you didn't, you know, necessarily have that, you know, before, but the conscience, you know, it gives us the power to choose between what's right and wrong. That's why I refer to it oftentimes as like the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's going to do all that. He's going to guide us into all truth, right? The idea here is that when you're saved, you experience a change of heart that results in a change of lifestyle. And you say, well, some people are not as far along as I am. Well, some people, you know, we're all at different levels. That's why you should never sit there and point your finger and say, well, how dare you? You're, you're not as spiritual as I am. Well, you may have been saved longer, or you may have, you know, done something, you know, different, or, or your um, vices are not their vices, what you struggle with, they may not struggle with. And so that's the, you know, but the thing is, is that it, it gives us the power to change. It gives us the power to change. Um, it, it, the idea is that it's of a new life, that the Old Testament sacrifices could never produce such a change. But the blood of Jesus brings with it that awesome power to forever change those exposed to it. We see this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says you know, uh, that we are a new creation in Christ. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says we are God's workmanship. After a person, but here's the thing, here's, here's the other side of it. After a person left the tabernacle or they left the temple, he was exactly the same person that they were before the sacrifice. There was no change. Why? Because the sin was just simply covered. It was not removed. When that person you know, uh, meets Jesus Christ and his shed blood, the change in that person is dramatic and glorious. I'll tell you this. I can't speak for all, but there's times you know, where we went to doors, and I'll see people just you know, visibly you know, crying because they're like, I just, they're like, I just feel so clean. And then you have some of the other ones that are just like stone-faced, and they're like, Thank you. Have a good day. But you don't know what's going on in on the inside. Because there's sometimes where you get that person that's bawling and crying and everything else, and they, never, they, just, were, you know, they just had some sort, of, some sort of emotion that you know, took over them, and they had really no change. You know, they were just like, okay, well, that felt good you know, for a moment. Well, it's not, you know, not about that. It's about the fact of what Jesus Christ can do for you if you've trusted in that sacrifice for your sin, right? Which is Jesus Christ. So, like I said, they could be just like those you know, that went to the temple or the tabernacle. They went up there, they made their sacrifice, but they left the same person because it didn't mean anything to them, right? I mean, the sinner is literally made a new creature and is indwelled by God himself. I mean, think about that. Once you're saved, God lives inside of you. He indwells inside of you. That's First Peter, uh, oh, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 
you're beginning to see the reason why I haven't, you know, quoted all these verses. This results you know, in a change of attitude towards sin, a change of affection for sin, and changes the atti- uh, activity in sin. If a person ever experiences the blood of Jesus, that person is forever changed. And you'll sit there and say, well, why hasn't this one person changed? Well, the way we look at it is, well, they haven't changed according to my schedule. Sometimes people are a little bit slower. Sometimes people, because you know, they went over and they got saved, but they, you know, we've already read, they want to stay on spiritual milk. They don't want to go towards the meat. They like the, you know, they like the baby bottle. And we got somebody, you know, actually a few weeks ago when I was talking about that, they actually, you know, thought that I was criticizing people, you know, for being on spiritual milk. And I said, no, we all got to start off somewhere. I said, but God doesn't want to leave you there. I mean, it would be kind of odd if Miss Pat was still feeding Lynette a baby bottle. I figured I'd give you that picture. But you'd be like, no, well, get that baby bottle out of your mouth and go eat some food, right? Go get, go get a steak, go get something. But the thing is, is that it, if they're now, you know, we're working towards that, like we're fine, you know, like obviously, you know, we have a you know, little boy, you know, right now that's learning all that stuff and he's moving, that kid, see, he sees food, knows that he can't, you know, I don't know if he knows that he can eat, he can't eat it, but I had a granola bar the other day and he was just like watching me like, I mean, just mouthing it, like, I was like, you have two teeth. You have two teeth. There's no way you're eating a granola bar. I'll tell you that right now. But he is, you know, but he does eat sweet potatoes. So there you go. we just uh, read you a, a quick story about an evangelist. When an evangelist was returning home from a service one night, he was robbed. The thief, however, uh, found his victim to have only a, a little money and some Christian literature. As the bandit was leaving, the evangelist called out, Stop, I have, I have something more to give you. The surprised robber paused. My friend, said the evangelist, You may live to regret this sort of life. If you ever do, here's something to remember. The uh, blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sins, from all sin. The thief hurried away, and, he, and the evangelist prayed that his words might bear fruit. Years later, he was, uh, he was greeting people after a Sunday morning service when he was approached by a stranger. What a surprise to learn that this stranger, now a believer in Christ, as a successful businessman, was the one who had robbed him years before. And he says, I owe it all to you, said the transformer man. He says, oh no, my friend, the evangelist exclaimed, not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin. You don't know. That's why oftentimes people say, well, why do you hand out like gospel trash? Why do you whatever? Because we don't know. I mean, God's word itself says it will not return void. So if you feel like, you know what, I can't go up there and talk to somebody. I can't whatever, but I can give them something. Or I can invite them to, you know, dinosaurs and God's word or whatever it is. You know, they're going to hear God's word at dinosaurs and God's word. Why? It's in the title. You know, God's words, you know, literally in the title. But if you go take you know, a, a track and whatever, and they, and they read it, who knows? And some people think it's coward, uh, cowardly to like go into places and like leave like one someplace in different areas. I'm one of those people. Because I just pray that when I leave it there, that somebody finds it and keeps it. But I always tell you that if, you're, if you ever leave one, especially with our church name on it, you better leave a good tip. And the reason, he said, well, why, you know, why do I have to leave a good tip? I'm giving them eternal life. If it's a server, they live off of their tips. I used to be a server in a restaurant, actually in a couple of restaurants. The good thing was, is I was saved. So whenever I got stiffed by a Christian, I was like, well, okay, well, that's horrible. And I put, you know, I put it in my pocket or whatever. But it was horrible hearing your coworkers who were cussing like sailors because they just came back from a table of Christians that left them nothing but a track. Because you got to remember, they don't realize that eternal life is being presented to them through Jesus Christ. They look at the fact that, hey, do I have, you know, is there any money left on there? And I saw some like cruel people, you know, Christian, some Christians did the, 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 the more the cruelest stuff more than heathens, like leaving pennies underneath plates. 
I'm going, just next time, just keep it. You know, just keep the track so that way they, they think that you're a wicked sinner because you're acting like one. So that way they don't, you know, get a bad representation of who Christ is. But that's why I say, you, you know, leave, it, leave 15, 20%. You know, some people say, well, that's too much. Well, actually, 15 is considered like the base, you know, and usually 20% is like, hey, that's pretty decent. And then now it's kind of harder to go up like 25% because you got uh, other, uh, you know, you got uh, inflation that doesn't exist. Yeah, some, you know, sometimes that's true. But like I say, we're also trying to get those people into heaven, right? This also has, a, you know, has the po uh, power to claim. The thought that is implied in the verses is that the sinner is bought to, uh, is, you know, is brought to Jesus through the work of the blood of Jesus. The, this is the idea of what it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, that the blood of Jesus does far more than just wash away sin. It also purchases us, purchases us out of sin and makes us the very possessions of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. If we are saved, God owns us, and that is why he can make any demands he chooses of us. We are his, and we are to obey his will without questions. Of course, the redeemed soul delights in doing the will of the Lord. We see this in John chapter 14, verse 15. There's power. There's power in the blood. Like the old song where it said, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb, right? Andre Crouch said, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on, the, blo uh, the, the blood that gi uh, gives me strength for, uh, from day to day, it will never lose its power. Thank God that there is power in the blood. No matter what you give Jesus, he will wash it in his blood and make it over again. Number three, the promise of the blood of Jesus. Verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New, uh, New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of, of eternal inheritance. The promise of freedom. That's what the blood of Jesus gives us, is the promise of freedom. This, this verse, verse 15, speaks of redemption. The redemption through the blood of Christ buys us back from the power of sin and releases us from sin's bondage and frees us to, love, uh, to live for God. When a sinner places his faith in, in the, the blood of Jesus for salvation, that sinner is given a brand new life and a fresh start. Aren't you thankful that God gave you a brand new life and a fresh start? Now, just realize that, you know, you may have friends in your life or, or uh, people that you used to run around with. They may not, you know, uh, they may want you to do those, those same things. And you say, no, I'm not that same person. I'm not that same person that I once was. That's why when I had people came, uh, you know, come up to me and I started telling them how Jesus had saved me and all these other things, they're going, and, they, and they're looking back at, at who I was but they hadn't been around long enough to see who I, who I am today. And oftentimes you'll find out who your real friends are because your real friends will stay around. I lost a lot of friends or so-called friends when I came to Jesus Christ because they, they didn't want to hear it. They, basically what it came down to is they didn't want somebody around that was going to tell them that, you know, uh, that what they were doing was wrong or the fact that, you know, that the Holy Spirit in my life because Christ lives in you, right? is going to convict them to try and get their life straight. You may, there's times where people won't even say a word about Jesus Christ to their, their unsaved friends. But the fact that you're living it out you know, before them, they'll get uncomfortable around you. And you won't even have to say anything. But I suggest that you actually do say something so that way they know the reason why they feel uncomfortable. Say, I want to tell you about somebody that's going to make your life a whole lot better. I mean, this is the reason why, obviously, the, you know, the Bible refers, uh, refers to it as the new birth is because we got a new, a new life and a fresh start. John chapter 3, verse 3, and verse 7. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 
The redeemed sinner is reckoned dead with Christ at and alive in him by virtue of the resurrection from the dead. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The old life and all of its failures and wretchedness is gone forever. Psalm chapter 103, verse 12. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Yep, see, you got it. I knew you had it, that's why I kept on going. Isaiah, you got Isaiah chapter 43, verse, verse 25. What about Isaiah 38, verse 17? What about Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 20? What about Micah chapter 7, verse 19? And I'll read this one to you, but it's 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says this, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of, of, of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. We get a new life because why we're, we are a redeemed child of God. Thank God that our past is gone forever. And finally, we have this, this is the promise of a future. Jesus Christ gives us that promise of a future. Why? Through his blood. The blood of Jesus also you know, promises a, a future of heaven. When we trusted uh, Jesus as Savior, we became joint heirs with him of all that God has to offer. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. You looked a little too comfortable back there, so I was going to give you a little bit more. She had her, uh, she was up here like this. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. So as a result of this, we have the assurance that we will be with him in heaven when we leave this world. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Heaven and all it offers belong only to those washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is, only, there is no other way to enter that city but through the precious blood of Jesus. Do you know how many times I've heard a, per, a person say, I'll get into heaven, I'll sneak through the back door? There is no back door. <laughs> They're like, well, I'll find the loophole. You know what the loophole is? There is a loophole. you got to live a perfect life. Oh, wait, you can't do that? Oh, there goes your loophole. Because if you offend in one, you're guilty of them all. It's funny how people will say they're all, I mean, that's why, you know, it's so sad to see what's going on in America because you have a bunch of lawyers that are ruining America, but they can't ruin heaven. They can't find loopholes in heaven. So as I talked about at the beginning, the Bible is a bloody book. Our faith is a bloody faith. Many in our modern wor uh, world are turned off by the preaching of the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The songwriter, got it, the songwriter got it exactly right when he penned the words years ago when he says, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's what I would ask of all of us in here. If, if we would sit there and we would say, you know, I don't think I've ever fully done it. I know I maybe have gone here for years or, or whatnot. I'm not saying, and I'm not coming across as, you know, and, and judging someone and saying, you know, whether or not you're saved or not. You know your heart between you and God, right? And I would rather offend you trying to get you saved if you're not saved than to sit there and assume that you're saved and let you just go on, on your way to hell. But have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you, have you uh, asked your friends? I suggest you go about it a little bit differently. Instead of saying, have you been washed in the blood? They may not understand that to you. But you can explain it to them. But you could tell them that, uh, you know what, I have a friend that will stick closer than a brother. Not a, you know, a brother that's maybe that they grew up with. Just like when people say, well, I don't want to know God because if, if he's like my father, I don't want him. He's not like your father. He's a perfect father. He is the only perfect father. Thank God for that. 
Thank God for that. I sat there and I began to think of, you know, another songwriter, Robert Lowry, wrote this, and I close with this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you guys say, well, why didn't you sing it? You don't want to hear that. <laughs> the Lord loves it, you know, to hear it. And he says, you know, it's a joyful noise to him, but that's exactly what it's going to be to you as a noise. And may not too, uh, maybe not too joyful. I'll be right back.